All right, let's get started uh, for this very special uh, Hot Politics Lab session with uh, uh, a host as presenter. And uh, of course, uh, uh, I assume most of you uh, are familiar by now with uh, Bert, that he works at Oscor and that he's a terrific scientist. Uh, uh, so I'm, I'm not going to bother you uh, with that introduction. I just want to do a slightly different introduction today and introduce uh, the best academic friend one can have. Uh, Bert Bakker, who uh, I have known now for, what is it, maybe 10 years already. We should have a celebration, maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> and, uh, uh, and it's been a, a truly uh, inspiring uh, collaboration that we've had uh, for the last 10 years, starting, uh, as, we recently, as you recently described, in a very damp office in, uh, mm -hmm. in a container building at the University of Southern Denmark, and now having evolved to the University of Amsterdam, where I am actually at, I am in my office, and now I can also show you the box of, uh, of these coffee mugs, by the way, uh, uh, because uh, they're, they're all here. Uh, look, <laughs> for all the people who've presented in the last two years. It was not fake they're news. Here. They're still here. I think no one, they're, they're, they're all reported in. None, none, none was stolen. So uh, I'm, I'm happy to report that we can start uh, sending them your way uh, uh, over the next few months, hopefully in person. Okay, uh, without further ado, um, I'm really looking forward to uh, Bert's presentation and to the Q&A, and in particular, look forward to all the hard questions on structural equation modeling. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, let me also, uh, thanks for the kind introduction, and let me also thank you and, uh, and Christian and Matthijs, Isabella, Mike, and Mariken, and others affiliated with the Hot Politics Lab. I think uh, we have shown in the last year and a half since the pandemic started that uh, that a fruitful academic environment can exist online. And uh, I, you know, obviously, it's more fun and also more engaging if we're in person. But I think we have uh, we have uh, set a solid record here, and I'm uh, uh, happy to uh, contribute a little bit to that today with some uh, presentation of some ongoing work. So I'm gonna share my screen. And um, the title of today's talk is um, uh, uh, Reconsidering the Relationship Between Self-Reported Personality Traits and Political Preferences. So it's, it, does it, it won't be a surprise to anybody listening that a lot of the understanding of contemporary phenomena such as Brexit, the populist revolution in Europe, uh, Donald Trump has gone back to as psychologists and political scientists, like how can this be possible? And one of the explanation that is very common is this sort of, well, it's there might be some psychological differences that make people gravitate to specific leaders and specific policy positions. And um, you know, this has an important understanding for things like political polarization, because if our differences in politics originate in our psychological makeup, then polarization is not likely to disappear very fast because these psychological differences are hardwired and stable. So can, can we ever get the two opposing sides together and reunite them? Um, yet, when uh, Gijs, uh, Claire Goffro, and Finn Arsenault and I published a replication of the seminal paper by Oxley et al. Uh, on the idea that conservatives would be more threat sensitivity, sensitive to compared to liberals, uh, we, we published a replication two years ago, a year ago, basically showing that, we, that there are no ideological differences in the sensitivity to threat. When that paper came out, um, one of the responses was, well, you know, okay, so maybe physiology is not what sets people apart, but, you know, we know that self-reported personality traits predict our political preferences. And that um, is indeed aligning with the state of the art that psychological stable individual dispositions lead us to adopt certain abstract policy preferences. And Yet if we zoom in on the state of the art, we see that a lot of this work is cross-sectional. So also work by myself, right? So cross-sectional in a sense of personality is measured in the same survey as political preferences. And then the two are correlated. And there's this implicit or explicit assumption that because personality is stable, heritable, develops in early childhood, that it predisposes you to adopt these policy preferences. And there's this implicit causal ordering that you see here. And you know, there's a lot to say for this because personality has so-called rank order stability. So if you're relatively extroverted, even though that level might change, like people will stay relatively extroverted compared to people in other age groups. Um, moreover, personality is relatively heritable. Those of you raising kids, 
they see some of the good things of their own personality, but they definitely also see some of the bad things of their own personality reflected in their kids. Um, and, you know, politics is not one outcome, like personality and all sorts of things have been correlated with each other. And so personality has been associated with a right range of behaviors and life outcomes. So it's logical to tie them to politics, right? Yet, we also see recent and also earlier work that uh, personality traits do change over a lifetime. And uh, working in clinical psychology has shown that interventions can actually change, uh, can change you. That's not only in clinical psychology, but you know, those of you who are teaching at universities, we know that we make our students more conscientious, like they have to make their deadlines in order to survive in a university system. So personality can change. And so while the original assumption in a lot of the literature, and I say this again, like also in my own work, has been explicit or implicit that personality leads to political preferences, there might also be reasons to think that the arrow goes the other way around, or at least that the relationship is reciprocal, namely that political preferences can also have an effect on personality. We are definitely not the first to come up with this argument in a sense that politics has an effect on a wide variety of things. So work by Pat Egan in the AJPS last year showed that political preferences also affect uh, racial identities. Work by Michelle Margolis in the JLP a couple of years ago and in her book showed that political preferences have an effect on your relig religious identification. Remember, I also showed you that personality is maybe not as stable and unchangeable as we'd like to think. So, but why would political preferences have an effect on personality? Well, we say there are broadly two reasons. First is uh, we know there's work on ideological sorting, right? So people group together uh, along ideological lines. They live together with people along the same ideological lines. They interact with these people. And we know from work in social psychology that group norms are a powerful thing. So once you're part of a group, you also want to adopt their norms, right? And so it might be that people actually adopt the personality of political like-minded others in order to be part of that same group. That's argument one. Second argument, it might be that people on the left and right, liberals and conservatives, uh, are aware of the stereotype, stereotype of the stereotypical traits associated with being left or right. Now, if you're lefty, you, you want to be tolerant and curious and open-minded and visit abstract art museums. But now that the museums in Amsterdam have opened, I don't think all left people automatically ran to the abstract art museum. So maybe we just want to be certain people because of the stereotypes associated with it. So maybe also in political surveys, people are motivated to present themselves as similar to other me to, to members of the other group. So they report a disposition to which they think and know that belongs to that particular political group. So what I'm arguing here, and I'm gonna show you some evidence that for the argument testing that political preferences also have an effect on personality. So the study we're doing here, are two sets of studies. The first is a set of uh, panel analysis from different countries, the Netherlands, Germany, and the United States. And then two two-wave survey experiments. Um, aside from the Dutch list panel, which I very briefly touched about upon, all research was pre-registered at the start, which means that we pre-registered the expectation, the analysis plan, the, um, the testable implications of this, and uh, as in as much as detail as we could. Um, and uh, it's good to say what personality traits we, we focus upon here. We focus on we were inspired by this work by Chris Johnston and uh, Chris Federico, Howie Levine, who said, well, you know, there's a lot of different psychological traits correlated with ideology, but perhaps they group along the lines of an open versus closed personality. So that the open are curious, imaginative, uh, uh, tolerant, ri uh, risk-taking, less authoritarian, while the closed are dogmatic, uh, authoritarian, close-minded, conscientious. So the indicators of this open versus closed uh, batteries, uh, open versus closed personality that we use here are uh, openness to experience and conscientiousness from the big five, where I have to say that openness is always reverse coded. So that is high scores are close-minded and uh, authoritarianism. We treat them separately, but it's, it's a family of open versus closed traits. And I'll label what is what in the particular studies. So the first test is uh, uh, the, the panel studies here. And a, a traditional cross-leg panel model would in the hypothesis, uh, the, the traditional hypothesis, namely that 
lacked personality have an effect on subsequent right-wing conservative policy preferences in subsequent waves. Yet we hypothesize that it's the reverse pattern is also true. Lacked right-wing policy preferences have a effect on subsequent close personality. Positive effect, right? So that's, that's the hypothesized effect. So the GACES panel uh, we rely upon in Germany runs for uh, the years that we used 2015, 2017, 2019. Uh, and we have measures of open, uh, so close-mindedness, we reverse code openness and consensusness. We treat the two indicators as, sep as in a multi-level model as separate indicators of a close personality and control for uh, which of the two traits it is and cluster observations at the individual. Um, and we have measures of left-right self-placement and support for EU integration, or actually then opposition to EU integration, the right-wing or conservative component of this. Um, and what you see here on the left-hand side are the, uh, the, 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 the traditional expectation in the literature that lacked personality has an effect on subsequent right-wing policy preferences. And that is indeed for both opposition to the EU, as well as right-wing political preferences, the case positive and statistically significant coefficients. Uh, these coefficients are standardized coefficients, so the effects are small, but you know, in political science uh, and psychology, most of our effects are quite small. Yet the key test of our hypothesis is for the reverse pattern, the effect of lacked political preferences on subsequent close personality. And that's what you see here. The effects are a bit smaller, but comparable in a sense that more right-wing uh, right wing political preferences at T minus one have a subsequent effect on more close personality in the subsequent waves. Um, why only one coefficient for the EU and not for left-right political preferences? The EU was only measured uh, twice, while the, uh, for the, um, the, the left-right self-placement, we had three measures. Um, so, Gase's panel, list panel wasn't pre-registered. That was our first test. Basically, the results align. Uh, and then we turned to the United States for the GSS panel. And that had in three time points, the panel that started in 2006, the panel that started in 2008, the panel that started in 2010. Uh, at these three panels, at each wave, political preferences were measured. And in each wave, authoritarianism was measured, a key psychological disposition belonging to the open versus closed traits. So the measures we use are these child wearing items developed by, um, um, by uh, Karen Stanner and Stanley Feldman. And uh, we have liberal conservative self-placement, partisanship, opposition to abortion, opposition to LGBT rights, opposition to social welfare. So a bunch of uh, different uh, tests. Here again on the left-hand panel, you see the effect of lacked personality, so lacked authoritarianism on subsequent right-wing conservative policy preferences. And you see that for abortion ideology, so ideological identification and LGBT rights, indeed lacked authoritarianism has a positive effect on subsequent uh, right-wing or conservative uh, political preferences. For PID and social welfare, the effects are not statistically significant. That aligns with some other work by, among others, Julie Ronsky uh, that, and, and Chris Johnson himself, that um, perhaps partisanship and authoritarianism as, are not as closely linked, nor are social welfare policy attitudes. Yet the key hypothesis we have is that the reverse pattern is also true, that lacked political preferences have an effect on subsequent authoritarianism. And that's what you see here. And again, you see that um, um, that, that for abortion attitudes, ideology, and LGBT rights, there is a positive and statistically significant effect of, uh, of, of uh, lacked right-wing policy preferences on subsequent authoritarianism. Um, so free panel study, what do they tell us? Well, you know, two of them were pre-registered, so we didn't have a lot of time, uh, a lot of opportunities to p-hack the hell out of the data set. It's pretty consistent evidence. The effect sizes differs a little bit. There's some variation across issues. Um, yet, at the other hand, these panel models uh, have limited capacity to speak to causality. And their assumptions are contested. So um, what could we do more? And therefore, we decided to turn to a series of experiments. And um, our expectation was that if we would make political preference, preferences salient, that would cause people to report levels of personality traits that were more aligned with their previously assessed political preferences. 
so what did we do? We, we have two experiments with the same design. In week one, we measured people's political preferences. And in week two, we primed people at the start with um, either that the survey was about politics, so with politics primes or a placebo control condition. And after that prime, we measured their big five personality traits or their levels of authoritarianism. So two separate experiments. And if making politics salient, and I'll talk about how we did this in a little bit, if making politics salient causes people to align their personality more with their political preferences, then we would expect that the week one political preferences have a stronger association with the self-reported personality traits post-treatment compared to the placebo control condition. So how do we do this? So data are from MTurk, people with 95% approval ratings. The Big Five experiment was uh, conducted in March 2020, 1,800 people. Again, remember, this was pre-registered. So was the authoritarianism experiment, which was also conducted in March 2020 uh, with uh, uh, both uh, with then uh, 2020 observations. So in wave one, we asked people's party identification, liberal conservative self-placement, presidential approval, uh, and in the Big Five experiment, items stepping into cultural conservatism, such as gay rights and uh, abortion, and economic conservatism, such as po uh, economic policy preferences and redistribution. Um, in week two, we re-invited these people, and um, we said, well, this, in the politics prime condition, we said this survey is about politics. And then we measured their partisanship, their ideological self-placement, their cultural conservatism, economic conservatism, and presidential approval. We did this in both experiments in the same way. And in the authoritarianism experiment, we made the prime a little stronger. We added Samara Klaar's uh, prime on uh, the, that we asked people to write a number of things they liked about their own party and disliked about the other party. So even a little bit of a stronger prime, but I'm the first to acknowledge these are relatively weak primes, right? So what does the placebo control condition look like? Well, here we, uh, we said the topic is about internet browsing preferences. And then we asked a series of questions about their browsing preferences, internet use, social network use, online shopping, online video games. And importantly, these questions had the same sort of structure of the wording as our politics prefer preferences, right? So it's a kind of like a partisanship question that would align, do you prefer the one browser more than the other and the strength of these browsers? So the questions had the similar structure. And then again, to match the Samara Clare prime in the authoritarianism uh, condition, we asked people to like uh, to list a set of attributes of a device for, in for internet browsing they liked and a set of attributes they disliked. So to make the prime as comparable as possible, as lengthy as possible, etc. So post-treatment in the Big Five experiment, we measured the Big Five with three items each. And in the authoritarianism experiment, we asked four items stepping into uh, authoritarianism. So remember, the test here is that um, if making politics salient in wave two makes people to report personality that is more aligned with their political preferences, then the effect of week one political preferences, right-wing conservative political preferences on close personality should be stronger in the politics prime versus the placebo control. So I'll show you a bunch of uh, um, uh, the uh, uh, a bunch of coefficient plots for different operationalizations of ideology because that's what we pre-registered. That might, might not be the smartest idea, but that's what we did. So I'll show you all of them, and we uh, we expect that the crucial test is the interaction effect between week one right-wing political preferences and the treatment condition. And if that is positive and statistically significant, then the effect of week one political preferences on a for on close personality is stronger in that condition in the politics condition compared to the uh, placebo control condition, and that is. Uh, what we find here. So you see the average marginal effect of uh, right-wing political preferences on personality. And you see here that across the board in always in the right-hand coefficient of each panel, the effect of uh, the, the right-wing political preferences on close personality. So openness, uh, close-mindedness and conscientiousness is stronger compared to the internet, uh, the placebo control condition. This was the same for the authoritarianism experiment. So. Um, we also here find that um, uh, although not always statistically significant, the uh, effects are in the right direction and uh, that right-wing political preferences uh, have a stronger effect on authoritarianism when politics is made salient. If we pull the results from these uh, two experiments, the results are obviously a bit stronger uh, in terms of that the standard errors get a little smaller uh, and they you know, reaffirm our story here. 
so what what is the what is the takeaway here? Well, the takeaway here is that if you, for instance, read literature reviews on the relationship between personality and political preferences, and I would recommend, for instance, the one by Chris Federico and Arya Malka, you see that there's ample of evidence that there is this cross-sectional correlation. Yet, if you also look at Chris and Adi's work, it's like, you know, across the board, there's some variation. But a lot of that evidence is based on these cross-sectional studies and has not considered whether or not the effect might also be partly reciprocal. And uh, what we have argued here is that political preferences might actually also cause personality. So people adopt behavioral and experiential patterns of uh, political similar others uh, and, and, and might want to report or motivated to report personality that's consistent with their political outlook, or they might know what their personality needs to be in order to match with your ideological identity. Um, and so why is this important? Well, Obviously, there's some methodological implications, but they're not the most important. You know, a small amount of endogeneity could bias estimates of personality on politics. So just to give you an illustration, in a standard model in the list panel, um, the effect on right wing or opposition to the EU of close personality is uh, as a standardized coefficient of 0.05. If we look at that in the uh, in the cross lag model, so we count for the, the alternative direction of the effect of of politics on personality, then the effect goes by half. You could say, well, Bert, these effects are tiny. It's like, yeah, sure. But if you look at the meta-analysis that have been published, uh, the effects or the associations between personality and politics are generally very small. So if you care about the one direction of the effect, you should also care about the other direction of the effect. Obviously, this also has implications methodologically. If we're studying surveys on political preferences and also measure personality, maybe our measures of personality are actually biased to some extent. Yet, that's the methodological take-home point. There's there's some broader implications for society and the and and the theory. So for the theory, obviously, um, I think the state of the art has been way too. Um, as, has not paid too much attention to the fact that the assumed causality of personality has not been tested so consistently. And in the few studies that have tested it, have not suggested that the, uh, that the causality is only from personality to political preferences. This has important implications for our understanding of contemporary politics. So um, if we wanna understand political polarization, and I don't mean particular just polarization in the United States, right? This is evidence from, uh, from, from countries also in Europe, such as Germany and the Netherlands, then, um, Political polarization can be exacerbated by people on different sides of the political spectrum adopting or perceiving themselves as possessing different personality traits. And so polarization is not only the consequence of underlying non-political psychological differences, instead opposite political loyalties might motivate people to enhance these psychological differences. And that gives us a completely different understanding of the role of personality in, in society. And so while personality, uh, while polarization might not be diff easy to solve, it might not be as hardwired as we think, and maybe part of the solution might actually be in politics rather than in psychological dispositions. Um, this has led me to a broader project, which I won't talk about, but I think we need to reflect a lot more about what we do in the personality politics literature. How strong are our effects? They're small, but we often talk about them as if they're huge. How do we model these effects? You know, there's raw correlation. There's all sorts of variables that are potentially endogenous to personality and political preferences included in that. Uh, I don't have time to talk about all these things, but I think, I hope this uh, set of studies shows you that the assumed effect of personality on politics is there, but that the effect is also reversed. So political preferences have also have an effect on personality. And I think that leads us to reconsider some of the things we think we know in political psychology about the role of personality in politics. Thank you. And I should thank, let me say that, because I find, I thank uh, uh, Gijs and, uh, and the other Hot Politics members as well. But I here in this case, I should thank my two fantastic collaborators in the United States, Yif Lelkes and Arya Malka, with whom I uh, have done uh, this, uh, this work. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Beth. This is a fascinating presentation, and I think quite some food for thought for uh, pol uh, political psychologists uh, in particular. Um, we already have uh, uh, several questions. Uh, I want to ask uh, everyone who would like to ask a question, please type down your question in the Q&A box uh, in the bottom of your screen, not in the chat box, but the Q&A box. 
Um, so uh, the first question is asked by uh, René Beckers. I, he uh, asks two questions, so I will uh, both uh, ask them to you, uh, Beth. The first one is, can you explain the causal identification strategy? And the second one is, what would you say to the personality psychologists asserting that the experiments show that participants in surveys adapt their responses, uh, but their personality has not changed? Um, the, let me start with the second question. Um, yeah, thanks, Rene. Thanks for joining. Um, I think that's a good that's a good question, right? So um, we don't have an objective measure of personality. We rely on these self-reported personality traits. So their subjective reporting of their personality has changed. Yes, that's probably true. But that is the personality measure that we use in the poli personality and politics literature. So if we care about that as a measurement, and I think you know, there's enough to say that we probably want to know if this translates into real personality, but it's safe to say that a lot of the personality psychology literature itself also relies upon these kind of measures. So if we show that that making politics salient in a political survey causes people to align their personality more with their political preferences, and we care about that type of measure, I think that is an important finding. But we obviously cannot speak to the fact whether or not this in their behavior make people more close-minded. And I think that's an important question. We look at the size of the effects. They're small. Um, so I don't expect people to suddenly become super close-minded uh, as their uh, as we make the in their behavior as we make politics salient. But I should also say something about the political prime here, right? Because the effects are small. But the prime is also subtle. It's a tiny, tiny, tiny thing we do is ask a bunch of questions about politics and ask them to list their likes and dislikes about a party. And if that can move people's personality in their self-reports, I think that is a that is a that is that suggests that maybe if we would make it a lot more salient, if you think about hyper-polarized environments where your politics is made a lot more salient, then the effects might actually be bigger in real life. But again, I'm overstepping the empirical evidence here. Uh, that's the first part of the question, I think. Uh, well, that, was the second, that was the second question. Um, the first question is the, the identification strategy. So um, as you said. As I said here, in the second set of studies, the identification strategy was a, uh, a strategy where we, um, where, where we made politics salient. So we, we, um, we made politics salient. It's hard to change, experimentally really change people's political preferences, right? So in a work by, by uh, Samara Klaar, who has uh, also made these sort of identity, made the political identity more salient, uh, that's that's the same logic we applied here. Um, Marco Steinberger, Chris Johnston, and Howard Levine in their 2012 book on on uh, on personality and politics also use similar sort of political primes, but um, that we use that so we use that identification strategy because we fought hard, but in the end thought it was basically impossible to get really causal control over the actual preferences, so we made it more salient. In the panel studies, it's cross like uh, panel models. Uh, and yeah, you can, uh, you know, we are, as I try to be in the, in the summarizing briefly of the three panel studies is, you know, we have to be very careful about assuming causality here. And um, uh, uh, this project has definitely learned me that there are different modeling strategies and different ways in which you could operationalize this. It's good to say the results are relatively robust to, uh, to, to, uh, to the to different modeling strategies, but um, I have more confidence in the experimental findings in the identification strategy than I have in the causal identification strategy of the cross-leg panel models. Thanks. Beth, I have one more uh, question uh, relating to the first topic uh, you talked about. So yeah. Simon Columbus uh, asks, yeah. you're presenting these results as showing an effect of political preferences on personality, but it seems to me that what you are investigating is an effect of self-presentation. Would you expect um, these effects to hold if you use observer reports? Oh, yeah, uh, I think it's self-representation, Simon. Uh, I, you know, I think that's that's what we what we're getting at here. Um, in a sense that people present and align their personality with their political preferences. But if we think about contexts where people um, sort and live and interact with the people of their same ideological leanings, 
if they self present and perceive them to to have personality that aligns with their political preferences, that does might drive people in the end also drive people on non political uh, aspects apart. So I don't think just studying the self presentational measures of personality is unimportant. But I want to be humble here. I don't think that a political prime in a, a survey should suddenly make me or somebody else in a survey behave incredibly different. But as I said, also in response to Kanae's question, um, at the same time, remember the primes were incredibly subtle. And if you think about what is happening in real life politics with constant cues of the groups to which we belong and the, the people we interact with, that might then have bigger consequences than what we see in the survey. But again, I'm overstepping from the results. So what I show in the survey uh, and in the, in the, in here in this presentation are indeed self-presentational measures of personality in a survey. And I don't know how that translates into behavior. Um, Eran Amsalem asks two questions. Um, first of all, Beth, thank you for this very important work. Uh, I have two questions. Can you say more uh, about why you used conscientiousness as an indicator of close-mindedness? And another question, are these effects ideologically symmetric? Yeah. That is, are the left and right influenced in the same way? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Adam. Uh, I hope you're doing well. Um, so why conscientiousness? So as I said, uh, Chris Johnston, Chris Federico, and, uh, and Howie Lefine wrote their 2017 book, Open Versus Closed, where they make the argument that summarizing the literature, um, a set of traits that have been consistently associated with conservatism, among which there is consensusness. So consensusness, if you look in the meta-analysis from Sibley and Duckett, Duckett, Sibley, Osborne and Duckett in 2012, it's a consistent positive correlation with conservatism. Um, they say, well, you know, we have this variety of traits that that have a have a that all align. So close-minded, more conservatives conscientious, more conservative, authoritarianism, more conservative, but also need for structure, need for uh, dogmatism uh, and a variety of other skills. So we thought, well, which of the two traits within that framework, if you say that these traits all align with this open versus closed um, uh, personality, and they have a little bit of evidence that there is indeed this open versus closed dynamic, that, that these traits align in a latent dimension. But if you think about it in that way, then consensusness within the big five together with openness would be the consistent correlates of, of right-wing political preferences. I, among myself, have also shown that a trait like agreeableness at times matters for specific political preferences, such as uh, the potentially agreeableness and economic policy preferences, but that gets too nuanced. So therefore we decided to limit ourselves to consensusness and openness. If you know, we actually did for all the big five uh, traits, we analyzed them separately. Uh, I mean, there's also we also looked at agreeableness uh, separately, and we find some indications indeed in the cross leg panel models that uh, that that political preferences sometimes seem to have uh, an effect on agreeable on subsequent agreeableness. But I'm not; it's not terribly robust, and and, and so we're a little bit. You know, we have a paper where where you can see these results, but we. I think conscientiousness is because of its consistent correlation with conservatism is the trait we uh, we decide uh, to also use. Um, did you read the second question already, Matthijs? No, did I? Yeah. Uh, let me go back. Uh, are these effects ideologically symmetric? That is, are the left yeah. and right influenced in the same way? Uh, yeah. Uh, so we don't test that. Uh, why? Um, we we ask already quite a bit from our data in terms of statistical power and uh, adding either subsetting on different groups or uh, subsetting on um, in the panel studies. Let me say this: in the panel studies, we don't because there really we 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 run into some power issues there. In the experiment, we did look at um, at the potential. Um, uh, heterogeneity of the effect, and we do indeed seem to find that the effects are, are the effects of the political prime of the right wing political preferences on um, or political preferences on close personality is a bit stronger on people on the left or so self identified liberals compared to uh, to conservatives. But you know, I'd have to say this test isn't terribly 
powered and wasn't pre-registered. So in the paper we reported, but I'm a bit cautious to talk about heterogeneity here in, in the effects. So it's for there, future work. There's a question by uh, Stuart Soroka. Are there contexts in, in which uh, political competition is more or less extended into everyday life? or in which some aspects of personality have been less clearly politicized, where you might um, expect less adjustment of personality-focused survey responses to partisanship. Yeah. Can you leverage cross-national variation to better understand the mechanism connecting personality to politics? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. That's a, that's a great question. And uh, you know, I still admire your work on uh, where, with, with your suitcase uh, traveled around the world to really get some leverage on uh, on, uh, on, on context in the terms of how people respond to negative news. And if you haven't read Stuart's work on that in PNES, you should. Uh, but uh, we gave our, I think by choosing the United States for the experiments, we probably gave ourselves the best chance of finding it um, because of the hyper polarized context uh, uh, and time that we study this in March 2020. Uh, at the same time, so Stuart, I think you're probably right with your hypothesis that context should moderate this, but we don't test it. The experiments are only conducted in the United, United States. They're pretty expensive to run with two waves, uh, even on MTurk. Um, the panels I'm really hesitant to make any leverage out of context because everything differs. The time periods, the measures of personality, the measures of political preference, the mode. So I am a bit hesitant to say that, yeah, the effects are weaker in the uh, in the GSS, which they are compared to the, uh, uh, they're weaker in the cases panel in Germany compared to the United States. And that's because of context, but it could also be because of relative impoverished measurement of personality in the German case or the time periods that we studied this. So the, the best test we gave this to is actually in the GSS panel, where we had the waves panels that started in 2006, 2008, and 2010. And you could maybe with the, some with some creativity argue that polarization was going up at that time period, especially during the Obama presidency. And we have some, if I remember correctly, it seems to have some suggestions that the effects of lack political preferences on for authoritarianism are a little bit stronger in some cases in the panel that started in 2010 compared to the panel that started in 2006. But we're also running to power issues there because the panels then get relatively small. So these estimates get more uncertain. So I think the best I can do is say, I think you have the right hypothesis that, that the salience of political conflict uh, should condition this, but I haven't tested it. Stuart asks another question. Um, imagine you could capture personality at source yeah. uh, between uh, right? In some magical way in which server response issues don't get in the way. Personality in our brains or uh, physiology. Do you expect that this uh, version of personality would change in response to political positions? <laughs> ah, that's a good question, Stuart. Um, that's a great question. Actually, you know, in the Oxley et al. piece, they hint a little bit at this, that the revert, the pattern might actually be reversed, that, that the pattern, that, that, um, that it, it might actually be uh, not caused by ideology, but by politics. In, um, I don't know. I, to be honest, I'm also not sure if I have enough knowledge of either physiology or the functioning of the brain, if I could give you a credible sense if that is true. I think what we're capturing here, though, is self, if, if, if we if what we're arguing here is correct and that it's self-presentation and or knowing what goes with your political preferences, then the answer is most likely no in the experiments. Yet, maybe the answer is yes, if we think about the actual political content where you, you where this, this sorting and self-presentational goals is not just something that happens just in political surveys, but also at the schoolyard, at, your, uh, at, 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 at the clubs that you participate, then it might get under your skin. But how that would, how that would happen, I'm not sure, but it, it, it would be, a, it's a fun hypothesis. Maybe is uh, the answer. 
Uh, I have a question by uh, Haley uh, Kalsal. It's related to uh, Stuart's first question, but I'll ask it anyway. Uh, thanks, uh, Beth. This is really neat. My question is about the, the experiments. I missed when you conducted when you conducted these. Were there any major events occurring in politics at the moment that were salient in the press? <laughs> that might have also encouraged folk, folks to perhaps present themselves less or more strongly in line with their in-group and differentiate themselves from their out-group. If That's not, right. it could be cool to do this again during, uh, for example, next election campaign, where these identities will be super salient. Yes, thanks, Melissa. We did this at a very uh, uneventful Haley. time. This uh, is Haley. Oh, oh, sorry, this is Haley. Oh, not Melissa. I was, uh, sorry. Uh, thanks, Haley. This is an excellent question. We did this in March 2020 when we're uh, during in the midst of the uh, Corona pandemic. Uh, so, uh, boy, does this replicate in a different point in time? I can only say that I, I'm not sure how context would interact with the prime maybe but as an outsider i have the impression that maybe the biden presidency is doing something to some extent to polarization but on the other hand there are all sorts of things happening in the states and in the in congress that i question whether or not biden is per se single-handedly decreasing polarization in the united states but i think it would be as you know we did this at one particular point in time in the midst of the pandemic um Alex Kopok has some work that shows that survey experiments conducted before the pandemic kind of replicate in the pandemic. So that would give me some confidence that it does replicate. But I'm, you know, you know, I'm all for replicating. It would be great if somebody tries to do this now and, and, and makes an argument why context is different and, and why whether or not it will replicate. I'm totally open to consider that context conditions this. Melissa Baker asks. Do you think politics is affecting personality traits or affecting people's ability, awareness, or willingness to express personality traits? And perhaps more importantly for a project, does this even uh, does this distinction even matter? For example, you mentioned liberal people wanting to express more tolerance to fit in with their group. This got me thinking about whether adopting liberal policy preferences changes personality, makes people more tolerant, or just provides an outlet for already tolerant people to understand this to tolerance aspect of the personality. Uh, therefore be able to express more tolerance. You can probably imagine a similar situation for other personality traits or even personality as a whole. Yeah, this is a great idea, Melissa. Um, yeah, wow, that's a, that's a... I think what, what I said in response to some other people, uh, in response to the first part of your question, I think what we're getting at it is the is is a self-reported personality and then the question is what is that is that a ideal personality or not i think because for the rest they're just personality questions i think we're getting at what we're usually think we're getting at with personality namely our in our evaluation of how we think we are across the board but i think what you might suggest has a very interesting take on how we need to think about the importance of politics on other outcomes, right? In a sense that may personality politics is not much more unstable than personality is. It also has a heritable component. Um, it develops relatively early on. Like if I think about you know things like fairness and 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 and, and outgroupiness that that all starts relatively early in life. So maybe we really need to. I think what you're getting at, and also what we're trying to get at at this paper, is that we that the single pathway from that it's personality and then politics is probably way too simplistic. Thanks. Um, I have a question myself, uh, Beth. Yeah. Um, so I was wondering, based on what you just presented, um, as you as you uh, now said, you have this assumption that you have personality and then you have politics, or maybe mm -hmm. personality, attitudes, voting behavior. That that's how how causality is often modeled. Um, I was wondering, uh, to what extent do we need to uh, think about both? personality and politics as uh, elements being more stable and deep lying and elements being less stable and deep lying. Um, I ask this because 
you uh, operationalize personality by the big five, but also by means of authoritarianism. And of course, some people would argue authoritarianism is more like a value or it's more closely, uh, it's, it's closer to political attitudes than for instance, the big five traits are. Um, so maybe it makes sense to already within personalities to distinguish between the deep lying ones and the more super, superficial ones. And the same, of course, is true for political attitudes. On the one hand, you have left-right ideology, and on the other hand, you have more, uh, you have policy attitudes about specific policies. So to what extent can we make a distinction within both, both personality and political attitudes between the deep-lying ones and the super, superficial yeah. ones? Thanks, Matthijs. That's, uh, again, uh, it's a good, good line of thinking. Uh, just to let me clarify one thing. So in terms of authoritarianism, we rely upon the measure that is close, the closest to considered apolitical, these child rearing values, because you know, some of the critiques uh, that I've, many people have, including myself, is that some of this right wing authoritarianism is definitely more of an attitude dimension than a actual uh, psychological disposition. And so Ariel Malka, one of my co-authors, has written a really good book chapter on the problems of the potential content overlap uh, that can be in these these personality traits. So right, so that that um, uh, certain aspects of personality might actually be political. Um, that's one that's a question for, that's a part for clarification um this project has explicitly not set out to test the heterogeneity that you could expect in you know you could say left right identification party identification liberal conservative self-placement are these more symbolic identity based components and then you have these more abstract i should do this the other way around right these are the, the low the symbol i started wrong, the the left right uh, identity components are these are these maybe deeper seated closer hardwired and then you have these abstract things that you that you need where you need politicians and 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 information for to form your opinions uh, I, Within the experiments, we the results are basically aligning. If you care about the p-value, there's some some are just below 0.05, others are not. But that there are no real substantial differences in the panels. We see some heterogeneity, and you could start arguing that that might suggest that indeed certain more abstract political preferences have less of an effect than others. But because everything is different in these panels, the time, the measures. The, the 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 lag between the years i'm really cautious about making that argument with this research design i do think it would align with a much bigger uh literature in in political science that 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 talks about the symbol symbolism of certain political preferences and the more abstract or complex natures of others and it would suggest then that indeed it are it there certain more symbolic preferences might have a stronger effect. We do have one test indirectly of this. We try to subset on the sophistication of our people in the experiment and the panels. But again, these tests become underpowered because the sample goes by half at least. We don't find a terribly consistent effect that the associations between political preferences and personality become stronger among the more sophisticated who would, as Converse and many others have argued, would have a more coherent belief system. Because that would be sort of an indirect test. But I'm totally open to consider this, Matthijs. And I think that's the same for personality. And I think you said one more thing that might actually be even more interesting is there maybe there's some sort of stable core to who we are and some self-representational layer on top of that that we can, that we can change and adapt. That could be really interesting to try to, to, to capture because you could say, well, but then the stable core is more important. But if the if the, the outer layer of flexibility also translate into how we present ourselves online, how we present ourselves to other people at the schoolyard or wherever you interact to your colleagues, that might have important comp components. So that there that 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 could be really into I thought that was really interesting in what you said in passing. So I, I think that. That is something to really consider. Thanks. There is um, one question by um, Martin Rosma. Uh, hi, Beth. Thanks for your great presentation on these cool studies. It made me think about uh, potential moderating factors. 
uh, both at the system level, uh, which is a nice question from Stuart Soroka focused on, as well as the individual level. One thing I wondered is if people differ in the degree to which they consider certain personality traits as good or bad, and if this will influence the effects that you find. Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I think that might be, I think that could be for conscientiousness, right? That could be an issue there. That's at least the first thing that comes to mind. It's not so appealing to write a letter. So those of you who are listening and applying to the hot politics lab, it's not so appealing if you write that you're very low on consensusness, that you forget deadlines, that, you, that you're that disorganized. Usually employers are not so interested in that type of, uh, of, of behavior, right? So there might be, and that you also see in this distribution of consensusness that most people, you know, there, there is a skewness in that, in that disposition. How that would affect the findings that we have here? That is an interesting question. Because we do say that, that it would be the most interesting if certain personality traits are more appealing or not towards people with certain political preferences that get back to the heterogene ideological heterogeneity. The way to maybe test this is to first ask people what traits they actually associate with being left or right. And, and so Doc Aller and Gaurav Sut have done some work in what people identify as stereotypical traits for Democrats and Republicans. That approach might give you a first impression if there are certain things that are not mentioned, and maybe these are the things that are less appealing. Um, that's an, it, 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 that's, that's, that's a, it's a, Good. It's something to really consider. Also, because I don't know how this is for you, Matthijs, raising kids or guys, but I don't know how it be, how acceptable it is to be super authoritarian in certain in certain contexts, or to say that at least that that or or to behave like that on the playground, right? You get some, you get some. Uh, you... <laughs> yeah, you get some what Ju normative judgments <laughs> feedback. Oh. <laughs> I at least get that. Those people. <laughs> um, I have uh, maybe one uh, final question. Hey, man, I have a question to... too. Ah, sorry, sorry, guys, sorry. You missed my hand again. <laughs> no, 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 you didn't, you didn't raise it, did you? No. Here. <laughs> to the left of my screen. Since the beginning. Man, I cannot see it. <laughs> oh, that, that's a great experience. Oh, really? Yeah, okay, sorry, but I, sorry, sorry. I have a question that, that, that I don't think can be answered in, a, in, in like two minutes. I mean, do you have a question that, that is short, uh, Matthijs? Uh, no, I don't think so. So ask your question and then uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll decide if mine is uh, easier. <laughs> okay. Um, no, I, 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 is it about I'm, La Femme, guys? Eh? <laughs> is it about La <laughs> no. uh, I just want to invite you to, to, to zoom out a bit more and... Um, and kind of engage Stuart's question, the first question again, but then uh, I'm not talking so much about surveys. But um, what, what I find remarkable to, about the study is you have three different countries, but also, if I remember correctly, three different personality characteristics. And so um, I'm wondering how connected this personality sort of politics leads to personality change, if you know, if we can say it like this. Uh, how systematically uh, 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 we can find this relationship, depending on, for example, political strategies, um, political cleavages that are present in a country, and whether uh, maybe sometimes it's authoritarianism, but in other times it's, I don't know, neuroticism or. Yeah. You know. uh, so uh, th there's a empirical answer to this, that in the United States, we relied upon authoritarianism, the GSS panels. And then there was the authoritarianism experiment that relied upon authoritarianism measures, which are relatively similar, like they're pretty equivalent to Stenner questions from the GSS to the uh, Feldman questions we relied on this four item AES battery with some re recoded uh, or reverse scale. So in that sense, within the United States, we have a relative equivalent test. We don't have a test of the big five in the United States in the panel studies. We do have that. We do have the experiment, which relies upon the big five. But then 
in the Netherlands and in um, Germany, we both rely upon openness and consensusness. And um, in that sense, um, there is some consistency across the tests that we have. Like it's not different context, different measures completely, especially although the concerns with the two item measures portrayed in the uh, in the GS uh, in the GASES panel are there. Um, they do seem to align pretty consistently with larger personality batteries that we rely upon the list panel. That's the methodological part of the answer, but I think what you would need to really get at context is either a series of cross-national experiments with fully equivalent measures. That's one way or fully equivalent panel studies. I actually think the experiments would be nicer uh, and easier because the panel studies, you know, we have to sit and wait for at least five years and it would be a relatively costly state of affairs to do this, right? Because we're completely dependent on, on secondary data. So the experiments would be nicer to do. That said, these two wave experiments are not terribly cheap to do either because we have to re-invite people. There are some dropouts, it's not systematically related to politics, but you know, it's, it's, so I think that that would be the best way forward. I think it's beyond what we can do in this paper because we're basically setting out that we're testing systematically that hypothesis, but it would be nice indeed to theorize and test how context matters here. Because I think what you and Stuart and others that have asked questions today indeed rightfully point out is that if the degree of conflict in society is different and therefore maybe also the alignment with between political preferences, identities, and these conflicts differs, that might moderate the, the extent to which this effect is there. And I think that's a very logical question to test. If you want to say what my hypothesis would be in a minute, I'd say that the stronger and clearer aligned the ideological conflict is at the elite level I think that would probably amplify the effects of self, the, the, the effects of making politics salient on self presentational personality. That, that would be my. Uh, so, yeah, you know, you could do a pre registered study with like two free contexts that vary quite systematically there and test that. Yeah, I think that you bring the bazooka in terms of, 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 of survey respondents, uh, enough survey respondents, and we have a pretty excellent test of that idea. Yeah. <laughs> Bringing in the bazooka, I'll keep that one for uh, for a paper title. That that uh, <laughs> that sounds neat. Uh, Bert, thank you very much. Uh, we've ran out of time. Obviously, you will get uh, the mug. Yay! Try to keep it uh, in one piece this time. I didn't break it. Oh, I oh, did. oh that was Christian. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, this one is for home. Then. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, Great. Um, we have two more meetings coming up uh, next week, Friday. Uh, I will present our uh, four year long data collection uh, using psychophysiological measures and what we learned from it. A couple of things have been published already, but uh, this will be some sort of meta analysis specifically also on how to analyze this type of data. And I will, among other things, cover our, the 98 different experimental treatments that we uh, did. And hopefully, if the models converge by then, also uh, go into the question of uh, uh, whether some people are more responsive uh, uh, to, to, uh, to, to our experiments than others. Uh, and then the week after that, we have uh, uh, four presentations in a slightly longer meeting. Uh, uh, and these are the presentations from our interns who actually started yesterday collecting EEG data uh, uh, in our lab, and uh, um, they will talk about um, uh, uh, the, the, their four different uh, uh, research projects uh, uh, on, on some very interesting uh, politics and decision-making uh, related themes. So uh, just before the summer starts, two really exciting meetings to come up, and I hope to see you there. It was really great to see so many people here today and have so many great questions, of course, following a great presentation. And uh, uh, I just want to say uh, to the people in the uh, Reuters Island area currently, uh, a few of us are having a beer at 4.30 uh, at the Crea Cafe. So maybe see you there if we can find a table. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and otherwise, uh, hopefully see you soon. Okay, thanks and goodbye.
Thank you, everybody.